Tuk. Yes, we are live. Hello, Elliot. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm really good. So today we are here for our Eco Festival. So it's a festival that's going to be all week um, on Kingston Library's uh, Facebook and YouTube channel. And originally we were supposed to have a, a, a very cool um, physical offer in April that we had to cancel due to the COVID-19 outbreak that we all know happened. Um, but today I'm really, really happy to, to have you, uh, Elliot, to talk about uh, Kingston Wilder side. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I'll do is I'll just let you um, do your talk and I'm really, really looking forward to it. That's going to be really exciting. And if anyone has questions, um, you can just put them in the comments and Elliot will try to answer at the end of the talk. Does that sound okay? Sounds perfect, thanks Marion. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, what a great week. I'm, I'm sure next year we can do it hopefully in person, but it's good that we're still doing a virtual version, which is hopefully will engage lots of people about the environment locally. Um, so thank you for inviting me to join you on this um, for this week. Um, so hello everyone, as, as Marion said, my name is Elliot Newton. Um, I am what we call a biodiversity officer, which is a, a role in Kingston Council. And, it, and um, I absolutely love nature and wildlife. And I absolutely love probably even more telling people about nature and wildlife and trying to get them just as excited uh, about it as I am. And over the course of the next sort of 20 minutes or so, I'm going to try and introduce you to some of the amazing wildlife that also calls Kingston home. Um, and uh, and tell you about how ways in which you can get involved and some of the things that as a council we're working on to try and become a, a leading borough when it comes to how we do how we preserve and enhance our natural heritage. Um, so before I start my talk, oh, I'm going to sneeze one second. <clears throat> That's right. Um, yeah, so before I start my talk, uh, one thing I always like to remind people of is. Um, that we are currently facing of uh, an, an array of emergencies and crises. Obviously, everybody is aware of the, the COVID crisis, but um, probably even more precedent in my mind and probably even more impactful in the longer term is the climate emergency and the ecological emergency that we're currently in. The current scientists now um, show that we're in the sixth mass extinction, which means that we're losing species and uh, wildlife at a rate faster potentially faster than that when the asteroid hit the earth about 65 million years ago wiping out the dinosaurs and we obviously do face lots of issues of climate change and um so there's lots it might seem a bit overwhelming and it, it can yeah it definitely does to me at times but there's so many things that we can do at a local level to try and combat the uh both the climate and ecological emergencies that we're in and there's a lot of overlap there as well so it, while I go through this talk, which is not going to be focused on doom and gloom, but more about the positives and the sort of amazing biodiversity that we have around us, it's always nice to have this in the back of your mind, just to remind you that, yeah, we are living through a very um, potentially scary time at the moment. Um, but yeah, so just have that in the back of your mind. Uh, but that is my doom and gloom bit over. And now let's look to the more sort of positive side of things. So most people think of nature, um, uh, they probably don't think of London, they probably think of Africa or uh, somewhere in the countryside, but I'm very pleased to tell you that London is a very, very um, biodiverse city, it's a very green city, as you can see by this amazing map here, uh, which was done by Giggle in partnership with the London National Park City Movement, you can see that London in the main is, is very green. It's about 49.5% green and blue space. And within that, there are about 16,000 species recorded in London. So there is a wealth of biodiversity. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, we've got a whole uh, uh, a lot of conservation history um, in terms of where conservation was somewhat founded in the movement, uh, protecting green spaces for bi biodiversity and community value. A lot of those um, sort of notions were founded in, in London to some extent. For example, Wimbledon Common was declared uh, a protected space in, I think, 19, 1851, which even predates the global national park movement. So London has always been a pioneering city, and it still is today. And becoming a leading national park city, the world's first ever one of those, we are continuing to try and show global leadership and how we can embrace biodiversity to the benefit of all in relatively urban environments. 
Um, and yeah, as I said, there's so many fantastic varied habitats within London that a lot of people don't normally notice. Um, and um, so hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be able to um, be a bit more aware of some of the wildlife that you might see when you're going on your, your walks or enjoying the green spaces that I think we've all been enjoying more than um, potentially you have been in the past with, with lockdown and everything like that. And obviously Kingston is down here in uh, in southwest London. The way it sort of projects out London, the, the Greater London there. So one of the 33 boroughs, we are very much on the edge of London. Um, and uh, to some extent, that that has lots of um, that has such of implications in terms of our our, our 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 green space. But the way we stick out like that, I like to refer to us as the Florida of London. Uh, sort of looks a little bit like that maybe. The way we project out. Okay, oh gosh, I don't know if you can see that screen there, it's a little bit dark for me. But so now zooming away, taking away from the London picture and zoning in on the Kingston picture. Um, Kingston is a very, very important place for wildlife. It's a very important place for people. We've got 180,000 people living in Kingston, but we've also got lots of wildlife and green spaces. And it's very important we recognise that too, to the benefit of wildlife, but also to the benefit of our own personal well-being and our own community well-being and our health as, 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 as a community. So some things to recognise when we're look, thinking of Kingston, we just zoom out a little bit. And we look to the north of Kingston, we've got uh, Richmond Park. Um, to the west of Kingston, we've got Home Park. To the east, we've got Wimbledon Common. To the south, we've got the Green Belt. Uh, and, um, if you, and then to, our, our, sort of to our, our western boundary, we have the Thames flowing through it. This amazing 215 mile river, which was once declared ecological dead, ecologically dead in about 1950, but now is home to about over 125 well, fish species just in the tidal elements it's alone. So uh, having the Thames on our doorstep is a massively important um, uh, ecological feature. It acts as a fantastic wildlife corridor. And these massive green spaces that I just sort of spoke about, these really great big ones, act as sort of um, generators for wildlife. They're pumping out wildlife into the environment. But wildlife um, does not respect boundaries in terms of borough boundaries or even garden fences to some extent, unless you're a hedgehog. Um, uh, so it's good to sort of look at the overall context of Kingston and see how important we are um, in it overall as a landscape and bringing wildlife communities together so we can be a sort of a tapestry of different land uses that wildlife can move through, whether it be birds moving through the sky, uh, fish moving through our rivers or hedgehogs moving through our gardens. It's very important we think about that connectivity and how we all fit together as a landscape and not viewing individual spaces in isolation. Um, so that's a very important thing to think of and, and Kingston is very poor, important within that context. But if we look at Kingston specifically, uh, according to Giggle, who are the Green Spaces Ecological um, uh, Record Centre for London, Kingston is 37% uh, green space. So there's lots of green space in the borough. I mean, and that equates to about 1,376 hectares. So that's lots of, in, when you say about one football pitch is a hectare, so that's a lot of football pitches of green space that we have available to us in the borough. And that's a very important asset that we have. And it's very important we try and maintain, look after that, and we enhance that to bring all these sort of ecosystem services that I can talk about in a second, which can improve the day, our daily well-being. We also have 39 sinks uh, recorded in Kingston, and I'm not talking about the sinks you have in your bathroom or your kitchen. These are what we call sites of importance for nature conservation. And as a borough, we're actually currently reviewing these at the moment. Uh, so we're looking at our existing sinks and potentially new sinks and having a seeing where they're at and if we could potentially declare some more and just look at the general status of the ones that are already there. But that shows you that there are some significant sites within the borough that are of a wildlife value in their own right. And what I love is my favourite places in Kingston are our nature reserves, our local nature reserves. And then we, as a council, there are 12 local nature reserves um, uh, on council land across the borough, all with their own sort of certain stories and sort of assemblages of species and uh, Hopefully, um, by the end of this talk, you have slightly more awareness about some of them and uh, be more inclined to visit them. Hopefully, during lockdown, you might have even had a chance to visit them potentially for the first time. But these are truly magical spaces, in my opinion, and they can be enhanced and we're using the, the communities around them. And overall, uh, according to the records that we've collated, um, uh, uh, so we get we send uh, we have all our records based uh, as, in London at Giggle, which I just mentioned, and they have recorded about over two thousand species just in Kingston alone. 
And each of those species has its own story to tell, has its own amazing biology, and hopefully can serve as inspiration to many. So I thought what would be quite interesting uh, is to go through some of Kingston hidden spaces that you might not be aware of. Uh, some of my particular favourite ones, even though, of course, I love them all, uh, but some that might even inspire you to go and have, have a trip to them. So the first one is the Berrylands Nature Reserve. It's formerly known as what we call the Rayburn Open Space, and this is a five hectare nature reserve, pretty much nestled away in the heart of Berrylands. About four years ago, the community and various charities worked together and uh, funded by a project from Thames Water and uh, led at the time by the Environment Trust. They restored this nature reserve and helped to found something called the Berrylands, the Friends of Berrylands Nature Reserve. But this is an amazing little gem. If you've been there, I'm sure you will agree. And um, what the rest during the restoration, we installed this amazing new bridge, which enables people to explore this great woodland, which has oak trees and all sorts of uh, um, yew trees and hazels and uh, amazing sort of flora and it also supports lots of fauna too and it's got the it's got a stream going through it called the Tolworth Brook which has been had been had the benefit of quite a lot of ecological restoration where we put in berms and deflectors to increase the variability of the flow which is good for fish to move up and once you get more fish moving up you get more things like kingfishers and herons and stuff like that we've also put a wildlife pond in here and it's looking really good full of dragonflies full of frogs and newts and all sorts of stuff. So it's a lovely little space. And I would always, I would encourage people to go there um, and, and join the friends group. There's something I'll come on to in, in a little bit if you live locally. Another little tiny patch of nature reserve that many people might not be aware of is what we call the woods, which is also joined to something called the Richard Jeffries Bird Sanctuary. And that is hidden just behind Surbiton Station. So many people might walk past it on their way to their daily, well, while they're going to the station um, and might not actually realise that there's a gem of a nature reserve sort of hidden away in the heart of Surbiton. It's got amazing things there like woodpeckers and uh, owls and bats patrol the night skies and song thrush and even badgers can be found walking around there in the evening. Um, again, a lovely little site which people, many people might not be aware of. And you, as, you, as I said just there, there's the Richard Jeffries Bird Sanctuary, which actually isn't a publicly accessible part of the space. But again, it's important in terms of its ecological value. But Richard Jeffries was actually a very famous uh, Victorian naturalist and book author uh, who um, lived in um, the Kingston area, or, or pretty much on your road. You can see a little blue sort of um, plaque to him when you drive past. And yeah, he's sort of a famous, gives, gives an idea of some of our sort of social history in terms of um, a famous Victorian naturalist who lived here. And it is that, but Richard Jeffrey's bird sanctuary is thus named after the man himself. So give it a Google. And if you walk in to the site, uh, you can see this nice little board that ha has been erected, which can tell you all about Richard Jeffries and some of the biodiversity that you can find in there. There's also been some improvement works to the paths that the council conducted last year. So it's a bit easier to walk around than it was previously. And I think my, the gem, I think, in our crown when it comes to our nature reserves is Tolworth Court Farm. This is a 50 hectare nature reserve. So an absolutely fantastically large space. It's got about seven field systems um, and it's got a fantastic history associated with it too. So it actually goes back to the Doomsday Book um, in 1086. And that's when it was first sort of recorded. But across the site, you've got these amazing ancient hedgerows uh, with fantastic complexes of species from so, field maple and blackthorn and hawthorn. And then you've got these large grassland areas, which can support a wealth of floral species, but also uh, invertebrates. And one place, one, one species that is very much um, does, does well here and renowned for by the butterfly, local butterfly conservation trust is what we call the brown hair street butterfly. And this is a small butterfly that depends on the, the, the blackthorn that is in the hedgerows. So that is the food plant for this particular butterfly. But we think this is probably one of the most important sites in almost well, you could say the south southeast of England um, for that particular butterfly species because they're there in such high numbers. Um, hundreds of eggs have been recorded there in the winter. So it is a very important site. And again, I don't think many people will know about it. And I think it is a great nature reserve at the moment, but it has the potential to be an even better nature reserve. So hopefully moving forward, um, we can make this an even better nature reserve for the communities around it and also the wildlife that can live in it, becoming a real sort of flagship site for London. Um, um, so yeah, watch this space when it comes to Tolworth Court Farm. Um, 
We also have our parks. We've got over, over 20 parks in, um, in Kingston, so not including our nature reserves. And this is another fantastic one, it's pretty much our biggest park, uh, looked out called Manor Park, um, and uh, has a great friends group there called the uh, Friends of, of Manor Park, unsurprisingly. And again, you've got this whole mosaic of different habitats through the whole site. So you've got the massive, you've got the big places where you can play cricket and football and go to the playground. But also, if you look around the site, we have areas where there are wildflowers and areas where there's woodlands, which are supporting all sorts of birds and meadow and sort of um, areas where there's anthills so despite just being a park it can also support fantastic biodiversity and this is something I think um, as a council moving forward we want to see our parks providing all the great immunity um, uh, value that they have in terms of going for picnics and playing sport but also around the margins around sort of areas we can do a lot of things to enhance the biodiversity value of these places as well making them more exciting places to visit but also providing um, more ecosystem services that rather scary word again um, that can support the communities around it too and help combat that ecological crisis that I uh, mentioned earlier another park that I absolutely love again it's got another fantastic friends group um, is called Fish Ponds, and this is in Surbiton, or in between, in between sort of Surbiton and Tolworth, but it's got um, a series of ponds in there and supports a wealth of habitats again, from a hay meadow to the pond system uh, to uh, various um, uh, woodlands, and another great space to visit. Uh, it's recently had erected an amazing bug hotel in the centre, uh, which is a great sort of feature, and you can see all sorts of species in there when you go in there. And uh, another, as I say, it's got another great friends group looking after it. And um, but what there? Um, if we had a time machine, or if I could have the magical power to bring back um, somebody, I would bring back this guy to have lunch with, to talk to him. And you might have noticed when I was talking about those various spaces just now, I was always mentioning the friends groups or the communities around them that um, are doing some fantastic volunteering work to support those spaces. And this chap is called Aldo Leopold. And to my mind, he came up with the most, the best definition of community or helped to enhance the definition of community. During lockdown, we've seen communities come together in incredible ways, helping our neighbors and providing food and doing amazing things for our friends and family and local people. But Aldo Leopold put another level of the word community. Um, onto it, not just focusing on our human relationships, but also our relationships with nature and the land around us. And he said this, he said, we abuse land because we see it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see the land as a community to which we belong, we may then begin to use it with love and respect, which I think is an absolutely amazing philosophy and something I fundamentally and wholeheartedly agree with. And I think if we just looked around our spaces, and I think, as I say, during lockdown, people have been able to engage in nature on a whole new level. Um, and uh, once we can imagine that the butterflies and the birds as part of our community that enrich our daily lives, then we can value it more and um, appreciate it more. And then that can bring a whole level of behaviour changes, potentially, that can improve our environment at a sort of grassroots level, but have global impact. And there's a really sort of pertinent problem at the moment because a lot of people um, are absolutely, uh, we could say, disconnected from nature, especially in our urban environments. Um, a rather scary statistic stated that about um, three quarters of all our children spend less time outdoors than your average prison inmate. And a lot of people are what we call um, maybe illiterate when it comes to the biodiversity around us. Like how many birds can you recognize they're cool of? How many sort of insects can you see and say this is that or, or, or whatever? So um, we do, we are suffering what we call a uh, nature deficit disorder, which means we're not engaging with nature as much as we could and should, which can bring a whole wealth of biodiversity. Apparently the average adult will spend over eight hours looking at a screen. That's probably increased even more over lockdown potentially. So these are really fundamental issues where I want people to view the natural world around them as a sort of wildlife, as our community that we belong to, and then that will inspire them to go out and enjoy it. But one thing that um, I think uh, one of my favorite quotes that David Attenborough said is how can people value what they do not know about. And I think that's a really fundamental problem. People don't know about the amazing wildlife that's around us. How can we value it? Because we have nothing to engage with because we just don't know what's there to love. So that's something that I think is really important that we can do to try and make all uh, 180,000 of Kingston's residents more aware of wildlife. That can only be a positive thing. 
And that's, and how do we encourage that shift change? So this is obviously a picture that was taken before lockdown. But I think when people think of Kingston, they typically think of the restaurants and the shops and the, the, you know, the bars and stuff like that. They might not think about the biodiversity that I've just been talking about. So how can we try and generate this sort of shift change in perceptions towards the natural world around us? And I think a big part of it is telling stories because the most amazing thing about wildlife well, I believe the more you learn about a particular species, the more fascinating it becomes and the more then your, oh, your mind gets blown and the more you want to learn, you just then can start realising how special it is. So it's really trying to try and work out how we can engage and encourage more people to want to love nature. And this is one way before I joined the council, because um, uh, I've been in the council since February, but before I had the privilege to go around to lots of schools and businesses and try and tell people about local wildlife. And what I would typically do is, um, and especially we're going into schools and talk about children, is I I'll talk to children is say that we have, as, I, as I've tried to demonstrate, lots and lots of wildlife. And when you go off to Africa on a holiday to visit the savannas or anything like that, the savannas, you might, um, you might go on safari and see the big five, which would be like a, a leopard and an elephant. But I think we have the wealth of biodiversity to support a big five in Kingston. And the sort of thing when I go through this, I sort of change the big five all the time. But I thought I might just take five minutes just to try and show you um, some candidates that I would put forward for Kingston safaris as you're walking around, some of the wildlife that you want to tick off your list when you spot. And this is one of my favourite ones. I think it is one of the most colourful birds that we have in the UK. And I'm pretty sure it's very difficult to argue with that. And um, it's called the Kingfisher. Um, Hopefully many of you might have seen it when you're walking along our rivers, um, maybe the Beverly Brook or the Hogsmill, both support kingfishers, um, but they are truly magnificent birds. And as I just said, the more you learn about it, the more magnificent they become. So they have these fantastic blue wing feathers. And you think that blue is, if you took the feather off, you'd think that blue is carried out, you'd think the, feather, the individual feather would be blue as well, but actually the feather would be completely see-through. And that is because the way in which the feathers interlock and sit on the wing and the way in which light travels through those feathers, it gives it that really enigmatic blue color. So it's what we call structural color in the natural world. So it's not blue at all, it's actually see-through, but it's just the way in which the light refracts through the wing gives it that amazing color. Whereas the orange on its breast is genuinely orange that is made by uh, a, a protein uh, called carotenoids and the brighter the orange the more attractive that, fe that that male will be to females so the more likely he'll be able to mate which again I think is quite an interesting thing and we'll learn looking at this specific picture here you can try and work out as a rule of thumb if this kingfisher has young or not because this kingfisher is holding that fish in its uh, it's holding the tail in the beak it probably means it's got young because it's going to present the smooth head of that fish to its young, which it will find in that nest, which they borrow away in our bank side. And it will like to present the smooth head to its young, not the sort of wiggly tail, which might not be so easy for the young to eat. So when you see, if you're lucky enough to see a kingfisher holding a fish, you can try and work out if it's got young or not. Because if it was going to eat it itself, it would have the smooth head first and then it would eat it itself that way. Um, so yeah, amazing creatures. And they're really good indicators of the health of the natural environment around us because they have to eat pretty much their, their body weight in fish every day. So the fact we've got them here, there's means there's enough fish in the water to support them. So what we'll call it indicator species. We also have these amazing guys. So Southwest London is an absolutely uh, renowned space uh, on the planet for these, for these beetles. And these are stag beetles, one of our largest beetles that we have in the UK. And these are the males. And the reason they get their name is that all these amazing structures that you can see on their head. And they are almost like antlers and that's why they are called a stag beetle. And it's only the males that ha fashion these fantastic structures. And what they do, they use them to sort of combat each other um, for, for, for mate, for female. So they will, they will wrestle each other on the top of a log and the one to push the other male off um, and remain on top, king of the hill or king of the, 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 the log, um, will have the opportunity to mate with a female. So that's why they have it. And they've actually sacrificed their jaw parts to create these antlers, um, or these antler-like structures. So when people see them, they might be a little bit worried about them. 
um, because they might think they're going to have a nasty nip on them, but they actually haven't got a mouth to bite you with because they've sacrificed their mouth for that job, for that, that structure on there, that antler-like structure. Another fascinating thing about these creatures is their larval stage. So these creatures can live about three to seven years just living away in dead wood, what we call saprozoic communities, or a part of the saprozoic communities. And these are just large larvae munching away on the dead wood, building up their fat stores. So when they're adults, they'll have enough energy to um, go and find a mate. But they might spend, as I say, up to seven years on uh, in, in dead wood, but maybe not even a month above ground looking for a mate. So they have a f f it's an incredible life strategy. So my main thing to you is, my impl implore you to do is, if you can have some dead wood in your garden, please do, because it's a fantastic habitat site, uh, habitat for a range of beetles, including these marvelous cap chaps. And also don't be afraid of them because they can't bite you and they're only flying around for a very short amount of time. Imagine if you were encased in deadwood for seven years. That's not something I would like to do. Um, and then our bats. Bats are absolutely amazing creatures. And um, normally this time of year, we're running things like bat walks, introducing people to the amazing nighttime world that we very rarely see. And across the UK, we've got about 18 species of bat. Only 17 of those are breeding. Um, and then in the London context, we've got 11 species of bat. And bring it down to Kingston, and we've pretty much got maybe seven, eight um, species of bat here, um, which is pretty pretty good considering the general sort of um, uh, 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 sort of wider context when it comes to, comes to our bats. And this is one of my favourite bats. It's what we call the Dor Benton's bat, and it's a river bat, so it's specially evolved to live alongside our rivers, and that's where it feeds, because rivers are fantastic generators of invertebrates, and all of our bat species eat invertebrates, so they're insect eaters. So how these guys do it, they fly just above the level of the water with these big feet that they, gain, they cast open, and, these, and they will then use these big feet as almost nets that they'll use to scoop up these insects, and they'll feed on the wing. And they can eat up to about 3,000 insects in one night. So that, again, is a really good ecological service, um, controlling invertebrate numbers. Um, but they are amazing creatures. One thing to be uh, aware of with bats is they have very sensitive eyes. A lot of people think bats are blind. That is not the case at all. They have really sensitive eyes. So light pollution can be a really big problem when it comes to bats. Um, so um, if, if you can, try and avoid lighting our night sky it would be great, especially in important commuting and foraging areas for bats. That is a really important um, thing to have, it, have in mind because they are great creatures. And this bird is absolutely a phenomenal bird. It is what we call a peregrine. A peregrine. Uh, the female is called the falcon. Um, and these are the world's fastest animal that has ever lived on our planet. They can reach speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour. So the history of the Earth is four billion year history. Uh, nothing faster has ever lived. And we have these chaps living in our urban environment. In fact, uh, um, this year alone, on the top of Kingston uh, College, we had two hatch and fledge, which is absolutely amazing. So the way in which these birds um, uh, uh, eat, and they because they're, they're amazing predators, like all our birds of prey, what they do, they fly up really high into the sky and they get really high, so they're pretty much just a speck. And what they're doing then, they're looking around, looking at the landscape, looking for pigeons to try and eat, particularly pigeons, that's their sort of favorite meal. And when they see one that they want to eat, they'll dive out the sky in what we call the stoop. And um, imagine if you were traveling at 200 miles an hour, you're gonna have wind in your face, you wouldn't be able to open your eyes very well. So what these guys have, they've got a special ad evolutionary adaptation called a nitrotating membrane. And that is a sort of third eyelid that comes across their eyes, they're see-through, almost acting like goggles, and they can then scoop up, uh, they keep their eyes open and target their prey effectively as they're going at such tremendous speeds. And one thing that London and Kingston is so good for, for these guys, um, and they're actually seeing potentially maybe even more, more than 30 or 40 pairs of these in, across London at the moment, um, is because they're very well adapted to live in the urban environment. Because historically, these are cliff, cliff loving species, we think, according to textbooks. And if you think about our, um, our cities, our tower blocks, our tower blocks are effectively in a peregrine's eyes, our cliffs. So, London is this amazing 
topographical landscape of all these sort of cliffs where you can, um, and which is perfectly adapted for, for these chaps. And obviously we have high numbers of pigeons, which are a great prey species. The last of my candidates for um, you, uh, just uh, for these big five are dragonflies. We've got about 57 species of dragonfly and damselfly in the UK. Okay. And this is our biggest dragonfly. It's called the Emperor Dragonfly. Um, and we do have them in Kingston uh, patrolling our, our rivers and our ponds. Um, but to start in the life of a dragonfly, you're not in the adult form like that. Similar to the stag beetle that we just spoke about, they spend a lot of their time in the larval or the nymph stage. And when they're a nymph, they look something like this. Uh, these amazing aquatic underwater predators. So they look very alien-like, don't they? Can you see that? This is a sort of, this is not obviously life-size, this is a carving of one. Um, but when they're living underwater, they can live underwater for about two years. And what they're ambushed predators. And what they do when they're living underwater, um, they're predating on various species, whether it be small under aquatic invertebrates or even small fish. But one of their most amazing adaptations when they're in this, this form is their mouth. So what they do, they manage to suck water in through their bottom and they increase the pressure um, in, 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 the, the, in their sort of thorax area. And then that pressure is then released, not through their bottom, but through their mouth, through their mouth part. And they've got a projectile jaw, which shoots out like this and grab any passing insect or, or even a small fish. So they're absolutely voracious predators. And yeah, you'll be able to find them in pretty much all our ponds that keep water um, um, over, over the winter. And then after about two years or in colder environments like Scotland, as long as eight years, um, they will then say, I'm fed up of being a nymph or a larva now. I now want to go and be an adult dragonfly. So what they'll do, they'll cry, climb a reed, and then they'll um, emerge out of the skin of the, of, the, of the nymph. And then they'll pump their wings up and fly around and then they'll be a dragonfly for potentially a month or so in, in, in the summer. And they do bring, especially the adults, bring these fantastic, vibrant colours that really do brighten our summer days. And I could talk about dragonflies all day long, but I'm not going to, but hopefully that gives you a small insight to their amazing world. So that hopefully gives you an idea of some of the amazing biodiversity that Kingston, Kingston holds in terms of our spaces um, and our species. Um, but how can Kingston be a leading borough for biodiversity? And this is something I very much want Kingston to become. I wanted to become, a, I want Kingston to become renowned for how we look after our green spaces and engage with communities and how we appreciate the natural world. Because as I said, this is so important, not only to wildlife survival, but our own well-being and our survival as well. So the more the habitats are thriving around us, the more we can thrive as well. Um, so one thing that we're working on at the moment, I'm creating what we call a biodiversity action plan. And we're going to hopefully, if we're going to form a biodiversity partnership, which will hopefully guide the strategy moving forward. And that will help align with the climate emergency that the council had declared, declared last year, last June. Um, so that is going to be our real sort of, our sort of strategy that we're going to try and put forward to be a pioneering borough of how we can, um, do some fantastic things. Um, but for us to do this, uh, we want we need the community to be inspired and involved as much as possible. So how, how can you get involved? Um, there's lots of ways. So as I said, um, there's so many friends groups across Kingston. So if you went back about five years, we probably had about one friends group in Kingston, um, if uh, maybe two at push. But now we've got in excess of 25, 26 groups, these amazing, passionate people that live across the borough near a nature reserve or a park. And they think, oh, our park can be a better space. How can we make it better? So and they can, especially in non-COVID times, we're starting to try and bring back some level of um, post-COVID um, volunteering, following social distancing now. But there's loads of ways in which we can volunteer in our local green spaces to make them better, adding to various other things that are going on. So one of my biggest sort of things to say is if you want to get involved, try and check out the, what sort of friends groups. We're trying to get all our friends groups logged on to the Connected Kingston website at the moment so we can have a central hub for them all so you can see where they are and see where the nearest one is to you that might be of interest. Um, um, but if you can't find one, you can always email me at elliotnewton at kingston.gov.uk and I can try and tell you where one is. And if for some reason there isn't a friends group near you, 
why not start one? We've got a, a fantastic chap in the borough called Andy Robinson, who works for our Ida Verdi contract. And he's absolutely great at going around supporting friends groups. And I really love doing that sort of stuff too. And the council was very much trying to empower more people to get involved and support our environment around us. So that is something you're interested in. Please do get in touch with your local friends group or us and we can try and point you in the right direction. Um, another thing you can do, something we're trying to sort of uh, kickstart at the moment, we've already had quite a lot of interest, which has been amazing. We're trying to come up with an environmental champion role. And this is a way in which we can empower you to in your street or wherever you live um, to be a champion in your local environment. Um, to sort of do great stuff for wildlife and, and that could come in many many forms um, so again if that's something you might be interested in please do get in touch with that email I can try and see if we could try and help work together and uh, sort of forging a really inspirational role that can encourage more people to join in and do some more great stuff and there's also other charities across the borough that are doing lots of volunteering opportunities further and above what our friends groups are doing and you can also engage with lots of what we call citizen science where you can go out and engage with really robust um, science and ecological monitoring programs to see how healthy our biodiversity is so we can get data to sort of inform our actions moving forward and obviously one thing you can do in your area just if it, irrespective of where you're living. If you might have a windowsill or a garden, if you're lucky enough to have a garden, there are lots of things you can do to make your garden more wildlife friendly. Make it more for putting holes in for hedgehogs or little habitat piles while leaving some longer grass um, for wildflowers and pollinators. Um, and even on our streets, trying we're trying to um, investigate ways in which we can encourage more ecological complexity and wildflowers on our street space but for that to happen we will need community support to say we want to move away from the sort of neat and tidy sort of victorian-esque sort of management but to embrace a more dynamic and ecologically complex environment that can bring more ecological benefit and help well-being benefits moving forward and one thing we're doing is also on the council's social media every wednesday we're doing something called wildlife wednesday we're putting forward a little factoid a little fact about the natural world that might be something you didn't know with always relevant to the Kingston area just to try and continue to erase the profile of our natural heritage um, and get more people engaged and thinking about um, the bit more wilder side of Kingston and of course you can try and follow this week with the amazing job that the EcoFest team are doing at the library service and engage with all the other events that are taking place um, this coming Thursday just another little plug, a local community group, which I've helped support for uh, over a year now, uh, are doing a talk on water vaults and how we can try and bring these amazing charismatic creatures, um, one of the UK, the UK's fastest declining mammal, back to our local river, the Hogsmill. Um, so that's great. So um, those are some ways to get involved. But one thing I'd like you all to do, if you've got 10 minutes to after this talk, if you go onto YouTube and just type in the Hogsmill, which is the name of our local river, um, and um, it's a nice little film we made last year, which will just show you the river in its uh, in its lovely sort of wildlife light and um, hopefully show you what amazing wildlife is around us. So do give that a Google. And uh, Marion, thank you so much for letting me waffle on for the last sort of half an hour or so. <laughs> but, uh, that was, thank you for coming. That was uh, absolutely great. But, um, um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we'll put the link to the uh, Oxmill video in the comments. So if people want to um, watch it, I won't have to Google it. We can just give them the link. That's great. Um, I don't think anyone has questions on Facebook. So no if problem. Have... Well, if anybody does have any questions, they might see this on the recorded um, stream or whatever. Um, you can always email me at um, this email address, which is elliot.newsnetkingston.gov.uk. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, but Perfect. yeah, I'll put that in the comment as well, but it's on the video. But yeah, no, thank you so much, Elliot. That was really, really interesting. And um, I don't live in Kingston, but that does make me want to come live there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was really interesting. I learned a lot, learned a lot of things. So thank you so thank much. You. I'm so glad you did. I hope you some people will learn as well. But yeah, any questions, let me know. And thank you so much for the opportunity, Marion. And look, yeah. good luck for the rest of the week. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, if anyone wants to watch the uh, rest of the program, the link is in the de de description. So just have a look at that. We have lots of uh, other events. And um, yeah, one last word or? Well, uh, go explore and find your nature. Yeah, find the nature that's close to your doorstep. Perfect.
Okay, thank you again, uh, Elliot. Uh, I'll see you soon for a new uh, ecological adventure, hopefully. <laughs> I hope so too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.